Hi everyone, welcome to a new video. Today we have a special guest with us. We're interviewing a software engineer at Twitter. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to the channel. Hello, Gerard. Thank you very much for having me today and for taking this interview. Of course, thank you for having me. Sure. Um, so let's start. Why don't you start introducing yourself and telling us how did you get into software engineering? Yeah, so I'm Gerard. Uh, I've been in software for about four years now. Um, and before that, I was an aerospace engineer at uh, Lockheed Martin. Um, and I got my um, BS in aerospace engineering, and then I got my master's in computer science. Um, and that's how I made my career change from aerospace to um, software engineering is that, through that master's program. Um, and then shortly after that master's, I started work at Intel. And I was there for about two years and then I joined Twitter and I've been uh, there ever since. Super. What do you think or what was the most challenging part of getting into software engineering? Um, I think the most challenging part was figuring out uh, what I needed to learn or the things I wanted to know or what, what to focus on. Um, software engineering is such a big, um, a big, a large discipline. Um, and so there's many different paths that you can take as a software engineer and just determining what your interests are and, and then coupling that with like what exactly you need to learn. Um, so fortunately for me, I was able to um, have informational interviews with people in the industry um, that allowed me to kind of hone in on the, the languages or um, topics I needed to focus on to be, be uh, effective in software engineering. Great. Is there any uh, community that you follow? Um, so when I first started, I didn't really have a community. I didn't really, uh, I wasn't, I'm not a very big, I wasn't a very big Reddit user or Twitter user. But since then, um, I've joined uh, the Twitter community. Um, and there's like these great hashtags. Uh, like one of them is 100 Days of Code, where a ton of um, uh, new and junior software engineers and software developers um, you know, document their progress in learning to code. And I, I'm pretty active on there, um, just to make sure that I can pass on any knowledge and help anyone. Um, also there's some great Reddit communities, uh, learn Java, learn JavaScript, learn Python. There are all great subreddits that will, um, help maybe answer some of the questions uh, that you might have, uh, if you're starting out. Great. That's a very good advice. So Thanks. what do you like the most about your job? Uh, that's definitely the people. Um, the people are amazing, um, very caring, very, um, you know, the, one of the goals of Twitter is that, you know, we want you to be able to come to work, um, as your best self, as your true self. Um, so we, what that means is, you know, whether you're, uh, whatever your ethnicity or gender identification, identification is, we want to support you and give you a place to feel home when you, when you're at work. Um, and, and not feel like you have to hide a part of yourself. Um, and furthermore, like from the engineering perspective, um, the folks I work with are extremely intelligent, extremely helpful. Um, they want to see you succeed. Uh, there's definitely not a culture of um, me versus them or anything like that. It's definitely a very inclusive culture uh, that fosters learning. Um, and it's been great so far. Great. So it does sound like a place where beginners can develop uh, to become more advanced engineers. So yeah. what, what is it like working at Twitter um, daily? Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, pre or post COVID? <laughs> Both. Before and yeah. after. Uh, well, pre COVID, you know, I would, uh, so my day would start off, I'd wake up about 6.30, uh, have breakfast, spend some time with my daughter. And then I'd run to work. Um, I'd leave the house, I guess, around eight. Um, and then I'd get to work by like nine or not nine, uh, by like 8.30. And then I, they, luckily my job had showers, so I would shower at work. And then uh, look at emails for about an hour and look into some other like um, administrative tasks that I might have. Uh, and then I would start digging into code. i start writing some code, reviewing some code in the mornings. And then because, um, the, the center of mass of Twitter is basically in San, San Francisco and in the West Coast. Um, my afternoons are basically packed with meetings. Um, and then I, I usually would leave work around five o'clock. 
Um, and that was just my schedule, but a lot of people would get in around 10 o'clock or um, what have you um, and just stay later. Um, and, and there's no really, there's no real like requirement for you to be there for like eight hours or anything like that. It's more just if you can get your work done, if you can um, meet your deliverables and meet your uh, OKRs, then um, you're, you're fine. You know, we, we don't really care about your, your work schedule. Um, just make sure you meet your meeting, go to attend your meetings and do all that stuff. So that was pre-COVID. Post-COVID, um, we've all had to adapt, uh, and Twitter has definitely been there for uh, its employees um, by providing us uh, the ability to work from home, uh, giving us resources to build up a home office and all that sort of thing, um, and definitely being flexible in terms of needing work, uh, special work arrangements. So for all the parents uh, of kids, you know, a lot of schools closed uh, for the summer and before, especially before COVID. So it was um, pretty hard to kind of juggle work and, um, and, and all of your other responsibilities. So um, we, we, uh, we were definitely support, supported by the company in that regard. So. Super, sounds like a very flexible environment. And oh, uh, yeah. there's a yeah. strong work-life balance culture, at yeah, least for what you're definitely. telling. Yeah, it's definitely a uh, uh, a work to live, not live to work kind of company, which yeah, is awesome. That's awesome. So, what do you do in your spare time? Do you also code? Yeah, so I have uh, an endless uh, list of uncompleted projects. So I, I just like to code in my spare time. Um, I like to pre-COVID, I used to like to go to the gym, stay fit. Um, watch some shows and stuff like that. So just typical normal stuff. Um, but, but yeah, uh, mostly just code in my free time. <laughs> <laughs> so is that a way to go if you want to stay up to date with your skills? Yeah, for the most part. Um, like, you know, when I was at Intel, uh, I was working in a very uh, niche part of software development. I was working in uh, high performance computing using like C++ and like working with super computers and stuff like that. Um, and so that like 90, 95% of the industry isn't working in that space. Um, so I was becoming hyper specialized. So I really took time to watch YouTube tutorials on like web development, full stack web development, um, back end development, front end development, all that kind of stuff, just to make sure that I, I still had the, the, those skills and, um, the ability to switch, uh, the, I don't want to say industries, but more so like switch to different um, fields within software development. So if I didn't want to do HPC or work with C++ anymore, I just want to make sure that my Java skills were good, my no, JavaScript skills were good, and I could build apps and speak the web development language as well. Great. So as you said, you code on your spare time as well. So I imagine mm -hmm. you have several personal projects. Mm -hmm. And if you have them, how do they relate with your current position? Or are they extremely separated? Yeah, so they are very, uh, they're, they're similar in that I, I do work at a, a, at a, a web company, um, but the languages and tools that I use are completely different from my day-to-day -day job. So just to give you an example, um, I'm, I'm a back-end software engineer uh, at Twitter, um, so I'm very comfortable working in the back-end, building up servers, um, I, uh, building database schemas and stuff like that. So when I was working on one of my side projects recently, um, it took me maybe an hour, hour and a half to build the entire database backend and the server backend. Um, and then I spent most of my time dealing with the front end and trying to make it look nice. Um, cause I'm just not a front end developer. Um, so, so yeah, uh, there, there's some parallels in terms of like just having the knowledge on how to build a server and, um, architect, um, um, like your backend server, but other than that, the languages and tools are very different. Super. And, uh, was it difficult to change position from your previous companies in terms of, um, the programming languages that you knew and uh -huh. if you had to like, um, learn anything new on the way when you switched to Twitter? So good question. Um, so I got my master's and most of the work that I was doing was in Java. Um, and then I actually switched to C++ at my next job in, uh, at Intel. Um, and so switching back to Twitter, we, uh, the, the stack is basically JVM based. So I was able to switch back to Java. Um, so I, I definitely developed some C++ skills, but I had to go back to Java, which was really, really, really fortunate. Um, but 
what really has changed is I write a much better Java code. Um, it's definitely a lot cleaner, um, a lot more succinct. Um, and I definitely have developed much better software engineering practices since uh, joining Twitter. Okay, so is it uh, Java your favorite programming language? Uh, I wouldn't say it's my favorite. Uh, it's definitely the language I'm most comfortable in. I can pretty much write, accomplish almost any task in Java without really having to think about it, um, think about the API or anything like that. Uh, but I, I mean, I use the best tool for the job. So, you know, if I want to, um, uh, like, write a script, I might use Python, or if I want to um, write some really performance intensive application, I'll use C++ or C or something like that, maybe even a little Rust. Um, but, but yeah, I, I'm definitely gravitate more towards Java just because it's familiar, but I'm kind of language agnostic. Super. Do you, would you recommend any particular language to someone that is just starting in the field? Uh, yeah, so um, there's really no wrong answer here. I think it depends on who you are as an individual, but if you're just starting out and you want to get a view of software development without too much of a, uh, a ramp up cost. I would, I would say Java. Um, Java is an object oriented programming language. Um, syntax is a little weird at times, um, but it's a nice bridge between C++ and say Python. So Python is like super, um, the, the syntax is very forgiving. It's meant to, for readability. Uh, C++ is, uh, programming paradigm agnostic, meaning it, you don't have to use object-oriented programming or anything, but it's also very, uh, the guardrails are off with C++, so you can do a lot of bad things on your computer to your computer. So Java is a nice happy medium because it's a little bit of a controlled environment, um, and it teach you, so, teaches you some principles that I don't believe Python does a good job of as your first language. So I would definitely suggest Java, um, and then, then you can branch out from anywhere from there. Mm -hmm. Great, great answer. Thank you for the advice. Yeah, um, so changing a bit uh, the topic, how do you deal with imposter syndrome? Uh, yeah, so uh, imposter syndrome is something that kind of plagues us all uh, in the software industry. Um, just because there's just so much to know um, and you'll never be able to know it all. Um, so just to give you an example, so I, I, was, uh, I shipped some code a couple of weeks ago that actually introduced a bug. Um, and it was kind of my first sort of... Um, production bug that I shipped and it was really, um, disheartening. Um, like I, I, it was a miss. It was just a complete miss on my part. And it was like, oh man, do I, do I even really know how to write code? Is it like, a, um, you know, I was really questioning my ability and I really was really cautious about shipping new changes. Uh, definitely took a hit on my confidence there. Um, but how I dealt with that is, uh, I had a really good team around me, really supportive, really, uh, didn't really try to like blame me for the issue. I took responsibility for my, my, my mistake. Um, and then I learned from it. Um, and then I basically was like, look, you know, mistakes happen. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't know what I'm doing. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm not meant to work at Twitter or any other company. It just means that I have to be a little bit more attentive to the things that I, um, am putting into production. Um, and also, um, if there's any, ever anything that, I need, if there's ever a uh, feeling that I am feeling like an imposter that I don't know uh, enough information or anything like that, um, the way I combat that is I just kind of try to commit myself to learning that new topic um, and diving in, whether it's watching YouTube videos, reading books, reading blogs, all that kind of stuff, to just to make sure to try to level out that playing field of the more senior engineers who've been there longer um, and who have seemed to have this infinite amount of knowledge of the system um, and just ask a lot of questions. So um, I think that's, I think imposter syndrome is something you should take very seriously and um, because it all also can potentially lead to burnout and those two are very tightly coupled. Um, so just make sure to uh, identify the signs early um, and, and try to combat them um, with any tools at your disposal really. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So this is actually a good advice for beginners. Uh, do you mm -hmm. have any other advice for beginners that want to start? Yeah, so um, I would say uh, software engineering is rewarding, but it's also uh, extremely challenging. Um, you know, it, it 
you you'll, you'll you're chasing that infinite that that uh, elusive dopamine hit of like getting your code to work right but there's so much work that goes into bef- uh, getting your code to work before it actually works right so you have to debug you have to do all this stuff and it's really really tough to um, deal with that on a daily basis um, so my biggest piece of advice is to um, get comfortable uh, not knowing anything um, and being able to operate in that sort of environment, right? So, uh, you know, I did, I had programmed in C++ in my undergrad degree at, um, and then I had to, when I joined Intel, I basically had to teach myself C++ and um, be able to contribute, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, you really have to be uncomfortable, become comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and then once you're, once you get to that point, you, you know, whatever, you can pick up anything. Um, and I think that's, I think that's crucial about software engineering. That's great. Uh, so what do you think it's the most valuable skill that someone should have if they aspire to work in a company like Twitter? Um, so intangible skills, um, or not intangible, but non-technical skills, I would say definitely be able to communicate. Um, you work in a, in, a, in, a, in a cross-functional team, you work uh, across companies, so you need to be able to communicate your ideas effectively and clearly. Um, and you need to be able to defend your choices in terms of design and development and stuff like that. And the best way to do that is to be able to speak well to your um, choices. Um, so definitely communication um, and just being able to work in a team. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, when you're first starting out, you're basically committing code directly to your own master repo. You're not really collaborating with other engineers. And it can be a little bit of a shock when you start to uh, work in a team and have to um, deal with competing ideas and competing um, uh, ways of working. Um, in terms of uh, hard technical skills, um, you know, be good at a language. It doesn't really matter which one. Um, uh, be good at a language. Uh, make some full stack web apps. Um, that'll give you an understanding of like how clients talk to servers and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and you know everybody says data structures and algorithms, uh, and that those are really important. Um, and the way you'll be able to get context on why they're important is building a web app and trying to um, serve requests uh, at scale or something like that. So yeah, yeah, that's a great advice. And following that topic, you have a YouTube channel and a YouTube video uh, talking about data structures and algorithms and the importance. Yeah uh in software engineering so can you tell us a bit more about your channel and what type of knowledge do you you share there yeah so uh my channel uh so i started my channel in uh, i think 2018 uh, october 2018 Uh, i just put out one video and uh since then it's kind of been a mixed bag (laughs) Uh, i have a little bit of c plus plus machine learning i have a little bit of uh, Java object-oriented programming. I have a little bit of intro to Java for beginners. I have uh, Q&A, I have career questions and answers and stuff like that. So um, if you go to my channel, you'll find a little bit of everything. Um, and I'm definitely responsive to comments and really want to help people uh, meet their potential or uh, answer any questions that they have. So if you have a, t- a topic of a video that you'd like to see, um, whether it's a tutorial or whether it's advice or something along those lines, feel free to drop a comment and uh, I will definitely do my best to, to make that happen. Uh, so, yeah. That's awesome. Thank you very much for this interview. I think it yeah, is going to inspire and motivate a lot of young software engineer. Or yeah. Inspire. I hope so. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye.